I'm excited to be looking today at Proverbs 1, 1 to 6 with you, authors, structures, and purposes. But before we dive into our material, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us through your kindness to David and Solomon, who recorded this information for us and provided it so that we could grow in likeness to you. Would you open our eyes to behold wondrous things contained in your word today, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. If this is the first time that you're joining us, I just want to remind you that uh, I'm providing in the link below the Facebook feed and the YouTube feed a link to the translation of Proverbs that I've done. I'm also providing a link to the commentary that I see uh, that I've provided for you for today. We'll be looking primarily at the introduction to chapter one. So uh, if you'd like to follow along, you're welcome to open up that commentary and uh, view that as well. I want to begin by looking at the authors and compilers of Proverbs. A lot of people read the very first verse of uh, the book of Proverbs, which says the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, and assume that all of the book is written by Proverbs, when in fact, uh, that's not actually the case. There are at least uh, four or five distinct authors who contribute to Proverbs. And I think it's important to view Solomon as an author and authorizer of Proverbs. You see, in the ancient Near East, the uh, composing of Proverbs, the discussion of Proverbs, the sharing of Proverbs was a key feature of wisdom. And uh, when people were regarded as wise, it was because they had skill in Proverbs and in sharing counsel. The land of Egypt was known and had been known for hundreds, if not thousands of years prior to the time of Solomon for its wisdom. Mesopotamian wisdom uh, was well developed, and we have examples of that available to us. And so uh, Solomon, the primary author and authorizer of the material that we find in the book of Proverbs, would have not only composed, as we know from uh, 1 Kings, uh, Proverbs, but he would have studied, discovered, sorted through, and edited Proverbs that he found from others. First Kings tells us that the whole world came to seek the wisdom of Solomon, so he would have had the wisdom literature and the wisdom ideas of the ancient Near East flowing through his courtroom for much of his early kingship. Let me just remind you what First Kings 3 says about how Solomon came to be wise. In 1 Kings 3, and verse 5 and following, Yahweh appears to Solomon in a dream at night and said, Ask what you wish me to give you. So God offered Solomon a blank check, and Solomon cashed it for wisdom. And specifically, what I've highlighted here uh, in verse 9, Solomon's request was, Give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? 
So Solomon didn't ask for wisdom generically. Rather, he asked for understanding to be a good discerner and judge of all the many cases that were going to come before him as king. God, however, being pleased with what uh, Solomon had asked, said that uh, I'm going to give you more than you asked for. And I think that's exactly who Yahweh is. He is generous and delights in giving more than is asked. And he says, I have given you a wise and discerning heart so that uh, there will be no one, there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. And uh, that gift that God gave Solomon then manifested itself in his writing of songs and proverbs. Uh, the king says that he wrote on botany and on zoology. He talked about the cedar tree, he talked about the hyssop, he talked about uh, animals. In uh, 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 33, we get this, he spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that grows on the wall, he spoke of animals and birds, of creeping things and fish. And... Uh, he spoke 3,000 Proverbs. Now, in the book of Proverbs, we only have a little over 900 Proverbs. So, clearly, we do not have all the Proverbs that Solomon spoke. He composed songs, 1,005. And we only get the Song of Songs in our collection, what we call the Song of Solomon. And I think it's important to note here the description that... Uh, the writer of First Kings gives to Solomon that God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind like the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. And then a number of men who were famed for being wise, Ethan the Ezrahite, who may well have been the author that of some psalms that we have in our Psalter. Heman, Kalkol, Darda, the sons of Mahol. His fame was known in all the surrounding nations. So, I think what we should learn from this text is that when we're reading the book of Proverbs and the, Sol the Proverbs of Solomon in the book of Proverbs, that the Holy Spirit's description is that this is not merely wisdom acquired by human thinking, but this is wisdom that comes from God, that God gave to Solomon, and that this wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the East. Now, I don't plan to spend any significant time exposing you to Egyptian wisdom literature or Mesopotamian wisdom literature, but uh, if that's something that interests you, it's available to read and view, and you'll find that in various places, Solomon's Proverbs reflect or parallel the wisdom that was present there, but when you take Solomon's wisdom as a whole, it clearly transcends anything that was uh, written and available in the ancient Near East in his time or before. So, Solomon, a key author. We also have the words of the wise in the book of Solomon. So, this would be Proverbs that Solomon compiles from other proverb writers that he believed were worthy of inclusion in the collection that he was developing. The words of the wise and Solomon's Proverbs are in Proverbs 1 through 25, starting in Proverbs 1 through 24, sorry. Starting in chapter 25, we get this um, heading that says, 
These also are the Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, transcribed. So, although the Proverbs of chapters 25 to 29 were written by Solomon or authorized by Solomon, they were not included by Solomon in the collection that we know as the book of Proverbs until the time of Hezekiah. Hezekiah is reigning about 200 years after Solomon's death, give or take a couple decades. And uh, one of the things that we know from the book of Kings and, and Chronicles about Hezekiah was that there was a great revival of religion in his days. That is specifically a revival of returning to Yahweh to worship him alone, turning from idolatry, turning from sin. Hezekiah sent uh, priests and scribes throughout the towns and cities of Judah to teach God's people the word of God. And it's interesting that it's in the context of revival that a king gives attention to Proverbs. Now, perhaps that's surprising. But the book of Proverbs, as I said in our first session, is not at the periphery, at the margin of Old Testament love for Yahweh. It is at the very heart of it because it provides God's people knowledge of how to live everyday life in relationship with Yahweh, knowing him, fearing him, trusting him, talking to him in prayer, and depending upon him for protection, and especially for wisdom and understanding. So uh, the tradition that... Uh, I'm a part of is a revivalistic tradition that is a tradition that values specific times of giving focus to drawing near to God for the purpose of having him draw near to us, as James says. And in times of revival, attention to wisdom is appropriate, as indicated by the fact that Hezekiah is giving attention to Proverbs during the time of his revival. Our next author shows up in Proverbs chapter 30, Agur. And we don't know who Agur was. Various suggestions have been made. Uh, bottom line, apparently the Holy Spirit doesn't think that it's important for us to have clear background information to receive God's word through a person. So Agur in Proverbs chapter 30 and in Proverbs 31, which we looked at partially in our first session, we get the words of Lemuel, but they actually turn out to be the words of his mother, which she spoke to him to give him guidance as a king. Again, precisely who Lemuel was, we don't know. So when Agur and Lemuel's material was added to the book of Proverbs to round it out, we don't have that data either, whether it was collected by Solomon and or added by a later person, we don't know. But what does seem to be clear is that by the time of Ezra the scribe, Nehemiah, uh, the book of Proverbs had come to its final form that we have it in today. Now, I think this teaches us something about uh, God, inspiration, and preservation. I think sometimes we think when we read 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed, and therefore it's God's word that somehow uh, you had God working with a person who just churned out a book, and then suddenly there was this material. But in fact, both uh, the book of Proverbs, the book of Psalms, and other books in Scripture show evidence of collection over time so that God was superintending not only the composition, but uh, the preservation and compilation of that material. 
And uh, God can be trusted to preserve his word for us uh, sufficiently for us to be able to access it and make use of it for wisdom. So that gives you some background about the authors and compilers of Proverbs. Now I want to move on to the topic of structure in the book of Proverbs. Again, let me encourage you, if you have any questions that you'd like to post, please feel free to post them in the Facebook chat. My assistant is online to pass those on to me, and or you can post them in the YouTube comment section as well. So what about structure in the book of Proverbs? Well, there are two basic types of Proverbs. When we think about Proverbs in English, you know, no pain, no gain, a stitch in time saves nine, look before you leap, he who hesitates loses. Uh, Proverbs are generally short, pithy uh, statements. But uh, ancient Near Eastern wisdom literature had short, pithy statements called sentence sayings, and it had types of proverbs that were lectures or speeches. In fact, if you take a look at uh, the commentary and uh, go to Proverbs chapter 1 over on the left, click on the verse commentary uh, of Proverbs chapter 1, it will bring up the first verse, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And I've listed there in bullet point all of the different uh, forms that Proverbs take in the Old Testament, from three chapter long poems, like Job 27 to 29, Psalms, uh, Balaam's prophecies are called Proverbs, uh, parables, like we find in Ezekiel 17 about uh, the cedar tree and the eagle or the vine that Yahweh plants, or even a, a narrative poem like we find in Proverbs 7 about the story of the simpleton who is seduced by the adulterous wife. We get lectures in Proverbs 1 through 9, short pithy sayings, and then interestingly enough, when we get into uh, the prophets, the word proverb can refer to a taunt, whether sung or spoken, or a byword, a single word that's pregnant with negative meaning, kind of like Benghazi or 9-11 for us here in the West. So proverb is a very flexible term. What we have in the book of Proverbs itself, however, are primarily lectures and speeches, and those are found in chapters 1 through 9 and sentence sayings. Now, sentence sayings and lectures and speeches need to be handled differently. So, uh, most of us are familiar with the, the prime rule of interpretation. That is context, context, context. And uh, if we take a text out of context, it can become a pretext for anything. Well, this is true. So when we're working in Proverbs 1 to 9, we're going to pay attention to the verses that come before, the verses that come after, make, making sure that we're interpreting any one verse within uh, the context of its lecture or its speech, which, by the way, one of the best ways to spot the divisions of um, the lectures in Proverbs is to pay attention to uh, the phrase, my son. And my son <clears throat> often indicates a new lecture. Now, not always, but often. It uh, introduces... Uh, the lecture here in chapter 1. It introduces the lecture again in chapter 2. 
my son, if you will receive my words. It shows up in chapter 3, my son, do not forget my instruction. Here, O sons, here we get the plural form, the instruction of a father in chapter 4. Chapter 7, my son, keep my words, and so on. So you get the feel there that uh, my son is a key indicator of where lectures begin and thus also where they end. I've said that there are lectures and speeches. Uh, I'm calling the father's words to his son lectures. Speeches we find uh, in four places in Proverbs chapter 1 with uh, wisdom's speech beginning, let's see here, beginning right at verse 20, wisdom shouts in the street, and this is the first speech of wisdom. We get another speech by wisdom in uh, chapter 3, one in, a very long one in chapter 8, and in chapters 9. So, in terms of the contents of Proverbs, we have two basic types, lectures and speeches, and sentence sayings. And the sentence, let me just talk about interpreting sentence sayings for a moment. Uh, it's, it's fairly uh, challenging, I think, for people to, who maybe you're used to reading a chapter out of the Bible when you do your devotions. And suddenly you come across in chapters 10 and following a profusion of statements that seem to have no um, immediate connection to one another. There's often not even a clear theme that runs through the whole section. And uh, this can be confusing. Well, let me uh, offer some suggestions for how to think about context with the sentence sayings. First of all, these sentence sayings occur in the book of Proverbs, and actually chapters 1 through 9 set the theological and ethical context for the book. That is, chapters 1 through 9 make it very clear that wisdom comes from Yahweh, it's found in knowing Yahweh, and that wisdom manifests itself in righteousness, justice, and equity. That is, it manifests itself in love for others that cares about their well-being, particularly with regard to doing what's right by them. So, that's the introduction. Proverbs 1-9 to lines us up. And then, in the sentence sayings that we find in 10 and following, we must understand them within that framework. So that's the first contextual element. The second contextual element would be when you encounter, let's just go, for example, to Proverbs chapter 10 and uh, take a look there. When you encounter uh, sentence sayings, you will want to know, well, how is this are the key words in this sentence saying used in the book of Proverbs? How is wisdom used? How is, so we have the word wise here, or foolish, and righteousness will show up. In fact, <clears throat> righteousness is uh, a key term that shows up so frequently in Proverbs chapters 10, 11, and 12 that it is the main theme of those chapters, whether it's in the form of righteousness, righteous, or the word upright, that uh, you'll want to pay special attention to that. And so we pay attention to key words. We then pay attention to the uses of those key words throughout the book of Proverbs because that helps create a context within Proverbs for how to understand those terms. And fourthly, so I've said, remember the introduction, Proverbs 1 to 9, to pay attention to key words, pay attention to the use of those key words throughout the book. And then finally, 
we'll look for uh, intersections between Proverbs before and Proverbs after the one that we're on. We may not always find connections, and that's not a problem. In fact, I will argue later that Solomon deliberately distributes the sentence sayings in chapters 13 through uh, 29, and Hezekiah's men follow the pattern that Solomon set up in such a way that wisdom is not gained by reading linearly because life itself doesn't come at us in logical step-by-step sequence. No, life comes at it from all directions. And the wise person has to know how to deal with the profusion of life's challenges. And Proverbs itself then becomes a training ground for learning how to do that. So, as we think about the content of uh, Proverbs, the sentence sayings have those contextual elements for our understanding of them. Any questions? Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to post those. I'm monitoring and my assistant says that there have been no questions so far. So what about Proverbs outline? I've given you kind of the the large scale structure. Let me give you a little more detail with that. And in order to do that, I want to call your attention to something called the BibleProject.com. The Bible Project has done a phenomenal job, for the most part, of putting together summaries of the contents of all the books of the Bible. And I'm borrowing this slide picture from the Bible Project because it nicely lays out the basic structure of Proverbs, chapters 1 to 9, chapters 10 to 29, chapters 30 and 31. Each of these Uh, are a separate section that, taken together as a whole, provides the wisdom that Solomon wants for us. Now, I'm going to show you on the next slide the um, final finished form of the Bible project. It's very busy. Looking at it at one time is really not the way to understand it. You need to watch the video that they give that uh, walks you through each of the aspects of uh, this diagram. So just kind of as a side note there, but I appreciate the good work that they've done and I wanted to call that to your attention. So coming back to this outline of Proverbs, in, uh, I think I've given you enough detail about Proverbs 1 through 9. Proverbs 10 to 25 have uh, two, we might say, three subsections in them. From 10 up through 22, uh, Solomon is the compiler or the author of all those pro- Proverbs. But in, in 22, 17, Pro- uh, Solomon... I see my writing's not that great, sorry. 2217, I will show you here on my translation. That's probably a little better. We actually get in verse 20 a statement, Have I not written to you 30 sayings? And in my translation, I put it in bold. Have I not written to you 30 sayings with counsel and knowledge? And then... I've done my best, uh, although this is uh, not without some um, possible alternative ways of doing this, to identify the 30 sayings that follow. So they don't uh, line up with our chapter divisions that we have in our Bible. And um, those 30 sayings uh, often uh, may, may be Solomon's, may not be Solomon's. Saying 19 is very long. It's a, an extended reflection on the uh, results of drunkenness. 
most of the sayings are relatively short, as you can see. Then, starting in chapter uh, 24, 23, I've highlighted uh, the words, these also are sayings of the wise. I've put it in bold because that seems to be a section heading. And then from 24 to the end of the chapter, we get additional sayings of the wise that Solomon uh, has included in um, this collection. Okay, so chapters uh, 10 to 25, I should have had 10 to 24 on my slide there. Uh, 10 to 24 have those three sections. And then 25 to 29, the words of Hezekiah and his men. Chapter 30, the words of Agur. Chapter 31, the words of Lemuel and actually his mother, who the author of the alphabetic acrostic on the virtuous woman or the woman of excellence in 31 verses 10 through 31 is we don't know for sure. It may have been Lemuel's mother or it may have been someone else. Um, let me just highlight something here on this a picture of Proverbs from the Bible Project. What they have done well is reflected the fact that we have in the book of Proverbs, both at the beginning and at the end, two women. Woman wisdom, who is set in contrast with woman folly, and the excellent wife at the end. So Proverbs actually begins in its first chapter by personifying wisdom as a woman. And whoever compiled the final form of the book placed at the very end uh, information about the God-fearing woman of excellence. So although the book itself focuses on uh, men and young men in particular, it uh, is not without its essential feminine elements and uh, providing wisdom both to men and women. All right, I want to move on now to our purposes. And I see that I'm actually over time. Um, well, feel free to head out if you only had 30 minutes, but I'm going to wrap up here on the purposes of Pro Proverbs and talk briefly about the three purposes that the first six verses of Proverbs uh, point us to. So, I have here on, uh, on the slide my translation of these verses. And I've grouped verses 2 to 3 together, verses 4 and 5 together, and verse 6 as the three locations where uh, Solomon introduces his purposes. His first purpose is to know. And I want you to highlight that because that points out that wisdom begins in knowledge. Uh, it starts with learning, understanding things. And what's interesting is though it starts with knowledge, we might even say cognitive or information, where it ends is wise behavior. That is, Wisdom is not just knowing things, it's, know, it's knowing how to use that knowledge to behave in a way, in particular, that is righteous, that is just, and that evidences equity. So that tells us that uh, Solomon's purpose is uh, not to fill somebody's head with information so that they can spout it off at the right times, but actually to give them the knowledge that they need so that they can live well. 
Secondly, the second purpose that we find in uh, verses 4 and 5 focuses on the audiences. And I've noted this here on my slide. Verses 2 and 3 give us the learning objectives. Verses 4 and 5 give us our learners targeted. And there's actually four different targets that Solomon identifies. So he identifies simpletons, the youth, a wise man, and a man of understanding. And, and you'll find the discussions in particular of the simpleton and the man of understanding in my commentary on verse 5. Let me point out, as we're wrapping up here today, that Proverbs spans the entire age gamut. And I think we should hear Yahweh saying to us that no matter what our age is and no matter what our level of wisdom and understanding, Proverbs has something to offer us. That is, there's really no sounding of the depths of Yahweh's wisdom. And we can join Paul in exclaiming, oh, the depths of of the riches, both of the wisdom and understanding of God. How unsearchable are his ways. They're past finding out. So, again, the second purpose was to look at who the audiences are that are being targeted. I'm going to come back to that and talk more about that because there are more audiences than those just mentioned in verses 4 and 5. And finally, wrapping up today, Verse 6 says that, our, that these Proverbs are about understanding Proverbs. Oh, that's interesting. Figures, the words of the wise and their riddles. And the word riddle is used in Scripture to refer to things like Samson's riddle at his wedding. Out of the eater came something to eat. Uh, out of the eater came something sweet. Or explorations of profound topics. Why is there evil if Yahweh is good? What do we do with human mortality and the meaning of existence? And explorations of topics like that are would count as riddles. So we actually have proverbs to understand proverbs. And one of Yahweh's purposes for us as his children is, number one, to communicate to us that we probably won't understand everything he says right off the bat. And since it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, we should expect to have to be diligent to work hard in understanding him. Well, I hope that uh, the lecture today has given you a overview of the authors, the basic structure, and the audiences that Proverbs targets. In our uh, next lecture, we'll be turning to the fear of the Lord and how that provides the essential entrance as well as the context within which all of wisdom is to exist. I hope our time has been helpful to you. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to post them either in the commentary or on Facebook or YouTube. May the Lord bless you and keep you on this Good Friday in which we're remembering uh, our Savior who would at this time be hanging on the cross for our sins. We rejoice in his marvelous work on our behalf.